Hey, so I'm Dietrich. I work on browsers and platforms. I work with probably a, a significant number of the people in this room based on all the uh, handshaking and hugs and stuff today uh, and yesterday and meeting a bunch of people for the first time in real life, which has been great. Uh, one of the things and one of the reasons why I end up working with you a bunch is because I end up doing a lot of collaborations, uh, setting up relationships, working with grants, uh, working with some of our biggest partners and all the way down to some of the smallest partners and the folks that are interested in our technology and oftentimes with people where IPFS doesn't quite work out and maybe they end up saying no or we can't really get it to work optimally. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of those projects, some of those relationships, some of the problems that we've encountered, and some of the directions that I think is really, really important for us to be able to go, uh, especially given the group of people that we have in this room. Um, so we work a lot in putting IPFS in strange places on the browsers and platforms team. Uh, honestly, like these really aren't that strange. These are kind of the places where software is, so or was. So th these aren't really that strange of places. These are all the places that IPFS needs to be should be actually is most of the time where it functions sometimes. These are some of the groups, uh, and maybe this is where it gets a little weird, right? So we're working with, you know, directly with Badger from Curl. We're also working with groups like Lockheed Martin and announced a recent space collaboration. Uh, we work in uh, Chromium, slowly but surely, uh, and with some of the groups here, like Agrigor, and um, we also work with groups like Agalia to be able to get you know, some of the web standards fixed across the entire web platform itself. Uh, we've made some progress in browser world. There's more uh, green here than I probably would have expected, uh, but there's still really a lot of ways to go for various numbers of reasons. Um, some of the projects that we've worked with where things worked, Brave, where we kind of duct taped things together. We put an entire Go IPFS node kind of adjacent to the browser um, and integrated it in some interesting ways, but also learned about some of the constraints of, of doing that. Uh, Companion, we have browser extensions across all the major browsers mostly, um, but with the advent of Manifest V3, that world's gonna change. We're gonna be able to do even less before uh, than we could before. Um, and with groups like Birdie, really supporting their efforts in figuring out what mobile story really looks like. Um, Fabrice from Capulun is here, where we've been experimenting with what a web-based mobile operating system looks like, um, and some of the challenges there. And uh, David Justice is here, and some of the folks from Trigram couldn't join, but they've been working on Duran, which is a mobile operating system, or sorry, a mobile app that's available on the iOS App Store as of, I think, two days ago, uh, that's experimenting with what a platform-aligned version of IPFS services on iOS might look like, being able to share, publish, uh, integrate your photo roll and things like that. Um, and Agrigore, which is really doing interesting things around multi-protocol browsing and also some experiments around what a deeper integration of IPFS and web APIs would look like. So being able to use the Fetch API to be able to post to an IPFS name or to a CID, for example. Uh, some of the challenges are not going to be surprising. Um, you know, the language that developers are using sometimes isn't available. Um, the folks at Capsule Social wanted to do things that we hadn't quite done yet with uh, in the JS world. Um, Beam wanted basic like node syncing between two nodes to be able to work kind of out of the box, also with JS. Uh, and you know, some of the even bigger partners that we have and the folks that we talk with like Ledger really were like some of the basic fetching stuff they wanted to do wasn't working. And some of the other projects that, that you know, we've worked with have some of these problems where depending on what their environment is, the type of data, sometimes the shape of the data, network availability doesn't actually function in the right way. Um, you know, Folks like uh, you know Badger were like, where's where's the spec? And they couldn't actually figure out where the spec was in order to be able to understand what the component parts of IPFS were in order to, be able to figure out how they could reasonably implement it. Um, some of the standards bodies work that we do, they ask for like, okay, where is that spec and what standards body is this kind of technology blessed under? And that's a pretty significant barrier to adoption for in a number of ways. Um, some of the folks like uh, TBD, they're figuring out what this new distributed web node stack that their building looks like. They need it to work in multiple runtimes, but there's not really a clear definition of what IPFS is and what it means on the different runtimes where they need it to work. Um, so, I mean, this sounds pretty dire and you're gonna hear really a lot of stories about IPFS getting really far in a number of places throughout the rest of the day. But I think this really is looking a little bit further, like how do we get from the people that are already, you know, kind of 
have our religion today around um, some of these technologies, the characteristics, some of the failings of existing systems, and how do we get IPFS into the hands of more people so they can benefit from what it actually brings and the gaps that it closes and the places like the web platform today or cloud or data availability uh, or even censorship mitigation and stuff like that. But I think one of the most important parts for me that I've learned over a couple of years of working with people where sometimes IPFS isn't working for them is that it's not clear often what it actually is. That there's a lot of code and there's a lot of different things that you can do. It is a toolbox for building decentralized and distributed applications, but at its kernel, it's not, there's not one thing to be able to point at, like a, a minimally viable implementation. And so what does it mean to be IPFS is not really clear. And that's one of the reasons why we're all here, because it does mean a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. There are various use cases that, as Juan talked about, pull go IPFS in different directions. And that was really challenging. It needs to go to a lot of places. And maybe, also like he said, it just starts with using CIDs. But unless we actually can all kind of come to an agreement about what that means, we can actually get a protocol, IPFS as a protocol, to where it needs to be, which is available in a bunch of different contexts, is uh, what should not be strange places, uh, available in many programming languages. Like, um, you know, there's some folks here from Algevera that are doing a grant working on extending Python functionality and maybe even implementing IPFS in Python because as the, I think as recently, is now the number one programming language in the planet, in terms of both like who are people are hiring for and what people are programming in, uh, we don't really have strong Python support. You know, one of the complaints we get is the one library we have is not really strongly maintained. So we need to be able to be in these places. And I think multiple independent interoperable implementations ends up being one of the best ways to be able to have an IPFS that people understand what it means and solve this problem because when IPFS is not well-defined and we can't have a shared understanding at least what minimally viable IPFS is, then we can't get to the point where we have multiple independent interoperable implementations, which is one of the things that's really gonna let adoption skyrocket and make IPFS work for the most amounts of people and get into the nooks and crannies of all these use cases in different places. So this is one proposal, which is at least, you know, at some point, get to an agreement as a community of implementers, practitioners, users, builders on what a minimally viable definition of IPS would be, IPFS would be. Um, and that'll get, get us like, pr probably to much more solid ground, even if it's just as simple as this, using CIDs, that we can communicate to a much larger group of developers, of builders, stakeholders, investors, biz people building businesses on top of these technologies. Um, one quick side note on interoperability and how important it is. Uh, the uh, developers' needs assessment for the web uh, was recently started at Mozilla and is now run by Google and Microsoft and now has run for a few years. And they use MDN as a way to get this survey in front of developers. And it's, so it's probably one of the largest surveys of web developers, which is the largest subgroup of developers uh, on the planet. And the number one thing that they found is still today, still today, even with much more interoperable web runtimes and engines, number one problem is interoperability and compatibility. Things not working the same in different places is still a number one issue. Uh, and they've started an initiative called Interop 22, which is 2022, and now they're gonna do one every year, which is kind of identifying what that minimum viable subset of the web is. And I think this is something where after over three decades of development of the web platform, these standards practitioners, very large businesses, uh, browser vendors who've been building these re web rendering engines and runtimes for so long, what we can learn from to really, really get ahead, ahead of where it took them so long to be is to adopt some of these learnings into how we build IPFS. And as you're building out your new implementations, think about how you can use a shared understanding of what IPFS is, even if it's at a very minimal level, shared, maybe even shared language, um, or to be able to get maybe close that and, and, and get this level of adoption, interoperability, and make it so compatibility is not such a problem uh, in five years or 10 years as opposed to 30 years on the web today. Uh, I think when you get down to that small of an idea of what IPFS might be, is it still IPFS? And that's something that as implementers, you get to have some decision making about, right? You, you control that. Uh, you're gonna be making trade-offs in every place that you ship IPFS. You get to determine whether you know, that implementation swings towards one end or the other of any of these or a number of other factors that, that you need to take into consideration. Um, but I think you know, a couple of 
closing learnings, things that we came out of with, like it's got to just work your implementation for the target environment. Like a general purpose IPFS, we've kind of found the limits of, and Wong talked a little bit about that earlier, where uh, Go IPFS started getting pulled in different directions and made it really difficult for us to meet the needs, especially when environments like mobile in particular have an entirely different network architecture and operating model that has strong dependencies up and down hardware manufacturers and telcos and actual radios and all these other things that, that really dictate how the the protocol has to actually function. Um, and if we can't do that, and if you can't do that for your implementation, understanding deeply who your host environment, what your host environment is and what those developers need, then they're going to abandon the implementation. Uh, I think another lesson is it's okay to throw away parts of IPFS that aren't working for you. Um, if you reduce the idea of IPFS into, well, is it using content address data? Is it using CI, CIDs? Do, do you always need a full P2P stack? Maybe not. Uh, maybe it doesn't have, maybe you're just working with data directly. Uh, for the regular web, well, what we call leech mode in IPFS network is kind of just how people use the web every day, all day, billions of people. Maybe that's okay in, in, in a bunch of circumstances. Um, and finally, like we need to, as a community, be able to make clear what IPFS actually means. And that doesn't mean up and down an entire stack. It doesn't mean the entire every edge in the concrete of every specification, every possible thing IPFS could do. But having a shared understanding of what the basic parts mean, what those basic components are, what are the minimum viable requirements to be able to something that you can call IPFS is really important. And and that helps uh, adopters reason about what trade-offs they're making. It helps them understand what bits are or are not composable and what can they build on. And it ultimately means what the benefits are to them and how they can continue building and, and actually try to solve that thing they're trying to solve that IPFS, we want to be the easiest way to get there. But uh, as we've learned oftentimes, it is not. And I think you know this week, we have an opportunity to, as a community, start pushing really hard on you know, building the implementations for the platforms that we're working on and for the constituent stakeholders, developer audiences, and businesses that are trying to build on it. Um, so there's a few lessons about some of the things we've learned and a couple of recommendations of ways to go forward as you're building out the whole next future of IPFS and letting a thousand implementations bloom. Thanks.